<laughs> Talk Bomb. Book Club Schmook Club is brought to you by TalkBomb.com. It's a book review show where at Chill and Kristen and her brother at Will Rogers 2000 talk about books and whatever else they want. Subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you typically get your podcasts. Hey guys, it's me, Will. And me, Kristen. And real quick before we get started, just want to say a couple of things. First of all, we're talking about Everything is Illuminated by Jonathan Safran Foer, a great book. Uh, I'm really eager for you guys to hear our conversation. I'm really eager to hear what you guys think of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Just so you know, we do, as usual, we have a spoiler-free review, and then we get into a spoiler-filled review. And uh, Spoiler Free is right at the top of the show. It's mm-hmm. one of the first things that you're going to hear. Just so you know, in the spoiler-filled side, in the second half of the show, things do get a little bit heavy. They get a little hairy. All right? Yeah. So if you, uh, just just to give you a heads up, mm-hmm. so that you can sort of maybe, uh, if you feel you need to emotionally prepare yourself, yes. or come back to this another time. Because William and I cry. Yeah, we actually cry. Like, not joking. Yeah. No, like, for real. Yeah. Like, not being like, ooh, I'm so sad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, we actually cry talking about the book. Yeah, there's some, like, heavy stuff that goes on. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, heavy stuff about, uh, about the concept of suicide, heavy mm-hmm. stuff about losing uh, family members. Uh, so nothing, nothing egregiously horrible. Yeah, but just you know, if you're not in the mood for that kind of thing, or if yeah. you have anything going on with you right now and you don't want to get like triggered by something, like you might not want to listen to this. Absolutely. One. Yeah. So we figured that we would just throw that out there. Mm-hmm. But hey, check this out. Yeah. Sharp pivot. <laughs> Quite. <laughs> uh, I wanted to throw this out there in case anybody is interested. I am going to be going live Mm -hmm. on Sunday evening at 9 p.m. Eastern. I can't wait for this shit. On the Hunt a Killer Facebook group. Uh, I'm doing a brand new weekly show for Hunt a Killer. Uh, It is uh, currently, it's just me. Uh, talking a little bit about the 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 actual like mystery boxes that yeah, they you send you. Yeah, you want to explain what it is real quick? Yeah, Hunter Killer. It's a it's like a subscription box, but with a twist. If you sign up for Loot Crate, they send you a box that's got like little like statues and toys and stuff. That's not really something that I'm very interested in personally. Mm-hmm. But sure, whatever. But this is instead it's an ongoing mystery. So box one is a, a, a box of clues, literally letters from basically a pen pal that's kind of like Hannibal Lecter. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's uh, so sweet. S- sucking you into this ongoing murder story mm-hmm. that evolves over the course of months. Yeah. So I've been doing this for uh, at least six months now mm-hmm. on our YouTube channel, the Talk Bomb YouTube channel. Now I'm going to be doing a weekly show for Hunter Killer every Sunday at 9 p.m. starting this Sunday. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be talking about box one a little bit. I'm not going to be spoiling anything more than you just get the box. I'll explain a little more about uh, what it's like, how you do it. And for these shows, I'm planning to have also little uh, sort of like bonus uh, clips of things. So I'm going to be telling a story just to give you guys, all you schmuck clubbers a taste. I'm going to be telling a story on Sunday of a local curiosity here in New Jersey that I've always been personally fascinated by. What? There is a movie theater, a local movie theater that I uh. used to go to all the time when we moved here that has a grave in the parking lot. Literally. William, that's awesome. I'm very excited about it. I'm planning and we'll see how it works out. I'm planning to go there and film. Like, Live? Not not do that part okay, live. Okay. I would throw to a clip and then come back and gotcha, talk more gotcha, about gotcha. it. But I'm planning to go there to to shoot some shots of this thing. That's awesome. Because it's literally a raised up plot of earth with it's a insane. grave. It's it's pretty cool. Oh, and so I cool. have a I have a couple of fun stories associated with it. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I'm going to be telling the story about that. Basically, it's just a hangout. It's That's a fun great. hangout. So if you guys are interested, go on Facebook and uh, at, uh, request to join the Hunt a Killer. Facebook group Mm -hmm. Uh, or you know you can tweet at me or whatever to get a link whatever you need but yeah I just want to make sure that there are a bunch of people there because I'm going to be having a good time I want you guys to have a good time and join me Uh, and yeah cool cool (laughs) I just realized you said have a good time and join me I thought you said have a good time enjoying me at first (laughs) have a good it was it was really (laughs) just so I can be perfectly clear it was have a good time period and join me (laughs) and that was a sort of an invitation (laughs) period period all right (laughs) Now, okay. enjoy the show. Yes. Hello, welcome. 
Welcome to Book Club Schmook Club. This is Kristen. This is William. And we are here to talk about Everything is Illuminated by Jonathan Safran Fur. Yes, we Fur? are. Four? It's not like you were getting sleepy at the end of that. Jonathan <laughs> Safran Fur. I'm not sure how you say it. Is it just four? I think it's just, I, I guess, four. Four. Okay. Two syllables. Yeah. Four. Four. I don't know. Okay. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. This is, uh, I, I looked it up out of curiosity because I could kind of, I could almost feel it. Uh-huh. Um, this is like such a specific thing. Yeah. I don't know if, I don't know if I'm being, um, very particular here or if other people feel the same way about this. Uh-huh. This was written either, or at least published, I think in 2002. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it feels like an era in time that I forgot existed. Yeah. And it made me very nostalgic for yes. it. Yes. Where it's like, it's the post-90s, but everyone is still very, like, overly verbose. Mm-hmm. And, like... Uh, it was a certain kind of writing. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Like, like For very... sure. Yeah. Sort of, like, uh, almost meta in the way that it approaches, like, well, why do we have to hold true to, like, old storytelling conventions? Absolutely. We're here to bust them up. We're the new young writers, and we can break out and do our own new thing. That- yeah, like... um. Dave Eggers. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Um, who else? That uh, was who came to mind right away. I never read it, but uh, Sex, Drugs, and Cocoa Puffs? Um, Not really, but no? that was from that same era for sure. Right. But uh, there's no like structural weirdness or anything. Like the yeah, new, it's like quippy. The new young author yeah. who's like breaking, breaking yeah. the mold. Totally. He wasn't even that young though then, I don't oh, think. Oh, no? Yeah. I don't know anything about Chuck yeah. Klosterman. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he yeah. wasn't like old as balls or anything, but he wasn't like twenty two, like Jonathan Saffron for Fower. Right, right. Yeah, but it it absolutely like zapped me back. Yeah, like I forgot I forgot the way that that period of time felt totally, and this felt one hundred percent like it, and mm-hmm. it made me miss it. Mm-hmm. Um, it made me miss it, and it made me glad that we've moved on. It was I've had a very conflicting experience reading this book. I feel the same way. Really, I do. Ah, oh, mm-hmm. I'm excited to talk about this. So, yeah, yeah. All right, let's just do it. Spoiler free okay. review. All right, spoiler free. Okay, this is starting with a very specific joke that you will not get. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Hopefully some people at home will get it. It is a Real Housewives of Beverly Hills reference. Okay. Not even this season of Real Housewives of Beverly Hills last season, but it's a famous catchphrase that some people might know. Okay. <laughs> so dumb. Everything is Illuminated is a story wrapped in a riddle and cash. <laughs> what? <laughs> Why was that a thing? <laughs> Erica Jane's tagline for The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills was, I'm an enigma wrapped in a riddle and cash. That sucks. <laughs> I know. But she's great. And cash. I feel like it needs another word in there. Like, I'm an enigma wrapped in a riddle. And cash and, and, and jewels. In, and, and, wrapped, and wrapped in cash. Like, that's also lame, but it, and ca- it feels like it ends too soon. But wrapped no, it, in a riddle. And cash. <laughs> I know, it's so weird. Yeah. But like, no, it, it would be too long if you added anything else. I'm an enigma wrapped in a riddle. And cash and jewels. Well, we'll have to dig into it more on our Erica Jane cast. <laughs> oh, I could do a whole Erica Jane cast. You know I love her. I don't think I could. I don't know who that is. <laughs> I'm I've posted that I re- about her on my Instagram before. She's I, genuinely great. I'm impressed inspiring. that I remembered her name after you said it <laughs> yeah. 30 seconds ago. <laughs> Singer of expense, ex- expensive, and how many fucks do I give? Would you like to guess how many? Is it none? Yep. <laughs> wow. <laughs> She's probably really cool and tough. <laughs> she is, actually. All right. All right. She's like, she's 45. She's a mother, and she has this career where she had, like, number one singles on, like, the dance charts and stuff. She, like, takes, she has videos where her ass is hanging out. She's great. Very body positive, Excellent. Erica Jane. Okay, anyway. <laughs> um, all right. Everything is Illuminated is a story wrapped in a riddle and cash. Anyway, it is both the story of a character named Jonathan Saffron Fower, which is the author's name. I found this a confusing device. Traveling to the Ukraine to find out the story of Augustine, a woman who saved his grandfather from the Nazis. He enlists a translator for his trip named Alex, who comes with his grandfather and his dog in tow. And um, did I mention Alex's English is, well, less than perfect? It's not premium. <laughs> no, it is not very premium. Uh, the story goes back and forth between Alex, grandfather, and Jonathan's journey together. The uh, Oh, wait, okay. The story goes back and forth between Alex, grandfather, and Jonathan's journey together. 
the book Jonathan is writing about his ancestors and Alex's letters to Jonathan about the book Jonathan is writing about his ancestor ancestors. Whoo! That's a lot of stories. Guess everything but the kitchen sink is illuminated in this one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> that was fantastic, Kristen. Thank you. Hey, why did that Erica Jane quote end up in there? Like, what made you think, like, that's the perfect thing to be in this? Because I because <laughs> I was writing Everything is Illuminated is a story wrapped in a riddle. And then now, okay, in my mind, that right. automatically autofills to and cash. And to cash. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Um, Her tagline this season was, I may be two people, but I'm not two-faced. Because in the streets, she's Erica Girardi. In the sheets, she's Erica Jane. Who is she when she's not in the streets or in the sheets? Uh, well, There's a lot in between those things, right? Like, isn't that like well, where you probably do most? Or of I living? just made that up. That's not what she said. Her, her. So what was her catchphrase then? I thought no, 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 no. I made up the streets and sheets thing. Her real name is Erica Girardi, but then her performance name is Erica Jane. Okay. Okay. All right. That's all. Well, so in the streets and sheets, she's Erica Girardi. On the stage, she's Erica Jane. Okay. That's so stupid. All right. No, it's <laughs> anyway, not. Anyway, we have to move on. I don't want to think about it. Her husband, Tom Girardi, is the lawyer from Aaron Brockovich in real life. Oh. And I think she didn't want to use his name as I, her performance name or something. I think I knew about that for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine <laughs> why. Disappointing. <laughs> uh, I probably mentioned it. Do you recommend Everything is Illuminated? Yes. I also recommend Everything is Illuminated. I do. I oh uh, I do. I walked away from the book feeling very confused. I wrote at the end of my spoiler sum- summary, in the end I would give it a somewhat soft schmuck recommend. I would give it I would give it a strong recommend, but I'm not even sure I like I, beyond just saying I liked it. Mm-hmm. Honestly, honestly I'm curious to see what we're even going to end up talking about. Me too. Because I was saying I, the same thing. I'm like I, 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 I was like I was really in, into the book. Mm-hmm. I was really fascinated by it. Mm-hmm. And when the book ended, I was like choking back tears and I did not know why. Interesting. Like it 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 hit me on a uh, like on the, I was I talked to Allie on the phone on the way home mm-hmm. because I had I bounced back and forth. I read and and me listened too. to the book just mm-hmm. cuz I've got I, I had to find ways to like fit it in. Mm-hmm. Me too. And um <clears throat> By the time the book was over, I was so like emotionally invested in what was going on, but mm-hmm. not really understanding what the hell was going on. Were you listening to it micro machine speed? So was there a really affecting part where he's like, and then and you're like, <laughs> <laughs> and the way that I cry is being like, <laughs> like to cry keep, all sped keep the up. pace. Yeah. yeah, no, no, I was not. Yeah, but um, I, I was saying to Ali, it was as if. The, it's as if like it's written as confusingly as it is because mm-hmm. there's a secret message mm-hmm. coded in uh-huh. it that hit me on an emotional level, but yeah. not an intellectual one. Yeah, it was like there was something playing backwards underneath it that was yeah. getting you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like there was backward masking, yeah. and yeah. it was and it was playing me like a fiddle. Yes, I I I did not understand. I do not understand. Interesting. Why? But I was barely keeping it together at the end of this book. Well, I cried at a part two, but not at the end of it. I well the, and I cried like <laughs> and at several times in the book. Yeah, I also. Yeah, yeah. What do you can you in Without the spoiler being free spoilery, side? Yeah. Let me think. Um, yeah, basically. I mean, it'll just be kind of vague, but um, a part where a character was writing down things that he wanted to remember. Yeah. Um, that really got me. Yeah, and the fact that he was doing it really got me. It's a, it really killed me. It's a really strange I was like book, weep, though. Weeping because that's not one of the ones that got me. Mm-hmm. But I'm not surprised to hear you say that. Mm-hmm. The book is written in a really strange way, where um, it's very nonlinear. Mm-hmm. Uh, like you said, there are basically three different methods of storytelling yeah. happening throughout the book. Mm-hmm. One is Jonathan Safran Foer writing about what happened. Um, in the 1700s up to the 1940s mm-hmm. about his ancestors. Mm-hmm. In the shtetl. In the shtetl. I wish we called towns shtetls. We don't have cool names for stuff no. like that. No, yeah. I like that word. Uh, one of them is the story of Jonathan Safran Foer traveling with Alex, mm-hmm. Alex's grandpa, mm-hmm. and Alex's grandpa's seeing eye dog, mm-hmm. uh, trying to track down the woman who saved Jonathan Safran Foer's father in the Holocaust. Mm-hmm. And the third is Grandfather, letters, right? Grandfather. Okay. 
And the third is letters from uh, Alex uh, to Jonathan Safran Foer critiquing the writing of Jonathan Safran Foer. So right. it becomes like literal commentary on the mm-hmm. book that you're reading. Right. You'll read a chapter where something really bizarre happens because even the, like Jonathan Safran Foer's writing within the book, yeah. the book within the book yeah. is written in a very sort of like floaty, surrealistic way. Mm-hmm. And then it'll be followed up immediately by a chapter of Alex, who mm-hmm. doesn't speak English very well, going like, why did you, if you're making up stuff about your family history, yeah. if you're uh, like like fictionalizing nonfiction events, because like Jonathan Safran Foer, like this is a bad example, but like he may, maybe he found out that like his grandfather was, this isn't something that happens in the book. Mm-hmm. Maybe he found out that his father was a blacksmith. Okay. But what he would write is that like, his his father had to like um had to commandeer horses mm-hmm. and get them to calm down or else they were gonna invade a village. Yeah. Like yeah. he really like he he overblows Right, he punches it up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then Al- so Alex is writing, like, why are you making people's lives fake? Yeah. Like why would you do that? And if you're gonna do that, why wouldn't you give them happier lives? Right, right. So it's really like the you read something that punches you in the gut and then yeah. the book goes like, Why are we doing this? Yeah. And so it, it it's constantly for me, at least, it was keeping me dazed. Mm-hmm. It was like a boxing match where, like, I you're found just it getting disorienting. It was very disorienting. I found it confusing. Yeah. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah. And I think that you're supposed to be confused totally. the vast majority yeah. of the time. Totally. And they nailed it. Yeah. Yep. Mission accomplished. Because even when I was talking to Allie on the way home, she mentioned part of the book that I was like, "When did that happen?" Yeah. Because I just like I I didn't even know what people were saying when I was reading it. Yeah. It wasn't always clear to me what was happening, Same. even when I was like. Holding the book in my hands and mm-hmm. going line by line, I was not comprehending totally. what I was reading. And I'm kind of a sweet simpleton. That kind of stuff is hard for me. I it uh, it it could go one of two ways for me. Mm-hmm. Either it could be something that it's like uh, it doesn't capture my interest, mm-hmm. so I don't even care that I don't know what they're telling me. And I'm just mm-hmm. like, I think we've had this before with other books. We have. Where- I, I can't think of what, but definitely we have. Yeah, I can't call it to mind, but like things where it's like, I know you're trying to deliberately confuse me. Mm-hmm. Congratulations, you did it, but I don't care. Yeah, stop. Like, yeah. I'm not interested in trying to decode your message. Mm-hmm. In this, I I was far more interested in, mm-hmm. in like, I might double back to, like, I feel like this is a book that, like, you would be rewarded for rereading. You would pick up Maybe. on more pieces for rereading it yeah not impossible uh so yeah i highly recommend everything is illuminated i thought that it was a really challenging book but one that i thought was uh genuinely interesting it made me nostalgic for like the early 2000s Mm -hmm. which for the most part you don't think of as having its own identity oh as somebody who's been listening to the early 2000s throwback station on spotify i beg to differ really uh yeah, I posted about that in the um in the book club Schmuck club Facebook group. It's great, huh? Oh, I remember that. Mm-hmm. But like, I guess I guess for me, I'm like like the '80s have an identity, the '90s have mm-hmm. an identity, '70s, yeah, the early 2000s, or I guess just the 2000s, yeah, 2000 to 2010, yeah. It's tricky. It, it, it still feels so new. But this book made me go like, oh my god! I remember reading this. This made me really want to read a heartbreaking work of staggering genius again. Uh huh. I really don't remember that. I read it, but I don't remember it at all. I remember I I like carried it around with me. Mm-hmm. I read it like I read it like three times, and I loved and hated it. Yeah. Simultaneously, it was yeah. like it was one of those books that like you would any person would be like, oh yeah, that book that was really hugely beneficial to me when I was in like my totally. late teens. That was that for me. Yeah. And I know that everything was illum- everything is illuminated is that book for a mm-hmm. lot of people. Oh, totally. And I read it feeling like I really could have latched on to this had I mm-hmm. read it back then. Yeah. I really, really like it now. And yeah. I am intrigued enough to want to like, I want to track down the movie and watch it. I, I do too. I just didn't have time. Neither did I. Yeah. Uh, I, I think I do want to reread it at some point with mm-hmm. some distance. Yeah. But I can tell you for sure if I had read this. In 2002, mm-hmm. prior to graduating high school, yeah. around that time, yeah. I know that I would have been like obsessed with it. I'm sure. Yeah. So uh, I highly recommend it, even though I don't really understand yeah. <laughs> Why? W- what was going on. It was just a fascinating sort of, uh, I don't know, exploration mm-hmm. of confusing, funny sometimes events. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
So yeah, high recommend cool. from me. All right, sweet. Gentle recommend for me. Fair enough. Yeah. Cool. All right, so I'll go into the uh, summary. Yeah, let's get spoilery. Spoilery so summary. jump out if you have not already read Everything All is right. Illuminated, or if you want to avoid spoilers, because we're about to spoil Everything is Illuminated. Mm-hmm. Okay, jump out, wrap yourself in a towel. I hope you brought your conditioner for your hair. Because <laughs> you're going to go take a shower in the locker room of the public pool at the Y that you just jumped out of. Here we go. All right. Wow. Okay. So that story and a story next to a story being the structure, let me break them down for you, even though they are all happening at this. Uh, let me break them down for you separately, even though they are all happening at the same time. In the story of Jonathan's family's past, we meet his great, great, great grandparents and move forward to the time of the war. Our first touch point is his great, great, great grandmother, Broad, who is found in the local river, river and adopted. There's more to it, but you know, we don't have all day here. Will and I will talk about it. She gives birth to Saffron. Sa- Wait, Saffron, right? How do you say that? Saffron. Saffron. Uh, his great-great-grandfather, who was a super freak of epic, perfor- epic proportions, doing it with 132 women over his lifetime who were attracted to the fact that he had a lame arm, question mark. Saffron survived a Nazi invasion with the help of Augustine and went on to have Jonathan's great-grandfather, but his pregnant wife and their baby died. In the Ukraine with Alex and his grandfather and trying to find the area that once had been Trackenbrod, Jonathan meets a woman who says she is Augustine, but who turns out likely to be senile. Alex's grandfather is a little squirrely around her. However, she was from Trackenbrod and, and takes them to her house where she has artifacts from the town that she was able to salvage, including a picture of Alex's grandfather with some other people, including Alex's father. Through letters, we get the story that uh, we get the story on that. Alex's grandfather was near track and broad when the Nazis invaded, and he confirmed that his best friend in the photo, Herschel, was a Jew in order to save himself and his family. Um, oh, I didn't write this, but that led to Herschel being killed um, by the Nazis. He's lived with the guilt ever since and never told anyone. He says that that's the reason Alex's father, who is abusive, is the way he is, that our father's baggage gets passed down to us. He wants Alex to break that cycle. So when Alex finally stands up to his abusive father, his grandfather is relieved and kills himself so that Alex can be free of any ties or responsibilities to that part of his family. It's very intense, and that's basically the ending. The book ends with a letter grandfather wrote to Jonathan explaining what he was about to do and ends mid-sentence. Honestly, I'm not sure how I feel about this book. The jumps around in time were confusing for me, as were the number of characters, although it did keep me engaged and there were very nice moments. I'm no professional book critic, but it felt overly ambitious to me. There were so many quirks, even besides the structure being all over the place, like text that's all mushed together, or the phrase, I am writing, being written literally 185 times. It would be weirder to only include one quirk, so I understand that he kind of had to go all in. And I don't hate it, but I think it got in the way of my getting fully attached to the characters. But it is different in a way that I appreciate. It's uh, it's not dry at all. And also, frankly, it humanized the Holocaust in a horrific way that I hadn't thought about in a while. So it's very affecting. I don't know. I'm rambling because I guess I found the book challenging, which I don't think is a bad thing. In the end, I would give it a somewhat soft schmook recommend. Mm. So, yeah, with stuff like that where it's like they write – Jonathan Saffron Farah writes, I am writing Mm -hmm. 185 times. That's the kind of stuff to me that reminded me of um, a heartbreaking work of Staggering Genius Mm -hmm. by Dave Eggers, where Mm -hmm. it's like, it's so, it's like faux experimental Mm -hmm. writing where, like I remember in a heartbreaking work, there's literally a chapter that's dedicated to an apartment that Dave Eggers gets where- I really don't remember it. I know I've read it, but- Where there's like a spot- where if you're if you run and you're wearing socks, you uh-huh. can slide across the floor. And he draws a diagram of the mm-hmm. floor, and it has markings to show like run here, stop here, you'll slide this far. Mm-hmm. And it's so quirky. Yeah, it's so like 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 what we were talking about in the bonus show last week, where mm-hmm. like uh, David Lynch, where it's like what where is that line between being uh, you are you have uh, kind of odd subversive things to say. Mm-hmm. And learning, people expect you to say odd, subversive things, so totally. you you force them. Yeah, like, you got to find a way to be authentic with them. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel like I feel like Jonathan Saffron Forward uh, uh, walks that line pretty well mm-hmm. in this book. But I there are a couple of things that I I feel like uh, with little tweaks, I would find them annoying. Mm-hmm. But uh, he does it just perfectly, so that mostly I'm yeah. just like. Oh, okay. All right. Kind of weird. All right. That's kind of weird. It's not great. It's kind of weird. All right. Yeah. The quirky stuff wasn't overly so quirky where I was like, oh, this is so annoying or anything. It was more for me, the time jumping and number of characters 
and perspective switching that kept me from being, I felt like, totally attached and engaged to the characters. Yeah. The quirks didn't affect that for me, actually. They were noticeable, but they were like, fine. I, I didn't like love them, but I didn't find them like really annoying either. Yeah. The only things that really bothered me were uh, in the very, very, very beginning, mm-hmm. uh, somewhat similar to 1984, where it's like you have to get used to their vocabulary yep. to understand what's going on. Our first narrator we're introduced to is Alex, Mm -hmm. who is – English is his second language Mm -hmm. and he doesn't speak it very well. Yeah. So he talks about how his grandfather um, doesn't want to work anymore because he's retarded. Mm -hmm. And it's not – he's not retarded. He's retired. Yeah. yeah. And he just – he flubbed the words. What was spleen? I have no idea. I can't figure out what that would stand in for. I mean basically annoyed. Yeah. But what word is he? I don't know. All the context for using the word spleen was like – Alex, you're spleening me. Okay, you're spleening me. I can't back think of what off. Word that's close to. I, I do not know. I don't know. You're annoying me. You're bugging me. I don't but know. But like, where does the? Because most of them, you can see where the the mess up would be. Like retarded and retired, or at least you know they have some of the same letters and stuff. Yeah. Spleen, I could not figure out. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. I, I yeah I could not tell you. But that took me so. <laughs> Same deal. Like, so you start with Alex, who speaks that way, and that took me back to a certain kind of early 2000s humor in a way that I thought was bad. And I was like, this is going to be tough. I'm going to hang out with like a Borat thing. Yep. Forever. <laughs> Borat is the first thing that jumped to mind. Very uh, Borat. I was like, oh boy, this is dated. I Googled everything is illuminated Borat <laughs> oh, to yeah, see I'm if there sure is stuff came up. If one of them fueled the other or stole from the other or what. And I I, I don't remember. I, I don't think I got anything. Yeah. But it's the character of Alex is very Borat y yeah. to start. Before they before he gets fleshed out, before he becomes a little totally. more three dimensional. Totally. But uh yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, like he's been much carnal with very many women. Yeah. Like everything. He he goes to famous discotheque. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's really crazy. It's like, like what the fuck, like really over the top. Yeah. Like whoa. Yeah. Either he has to sue Sasha Baron Cohen, yeah. or Sasha Baron Cohen has to sue him. I don't know. Totally. I don't know which way it goes, but yeah, nutty. I know. Also, I looked up a little bit of information about the movie. Mm-hmm. The character of Alex in the movie mm-hmm. is played by the frontman from the band Gogol Bordello. Oh yeah, I knew that. Which is weird. Yeah, I've never, I've never seen. I'm bummed that I didn't see the movie, but I watched the trailer. I wanted to same. watch it this past weekend, and then didn't get around to it for whatever reason. Yeah, same here. Yeah, same here. it's it's. Katie loves the movie. Like that's why we're reading the book. She hasn't read the book, but she love, love, love the movie. Oh wow. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I'm disappointed. Yeah, I want to. I well, we can talk about it in a future episode or yeah, something. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, because I want to watch the movie too. Mm-hmm. The screenplay was written by, mm-hmm. and the movie was directed by mm-hmm. Leave Schreiber. Yeah, I know. Isn't that weird? Totally. Yeah, yeah. Because when I was googling, looking information, it was like the Leave Schreiber movie. Yeah. So I thought he was in it, and I was like, who the hell does he play? Maybe he plays like one of his, um, you know, relatives in the past. Right. But then, yeah, no, it was just his like. No. Yeah, writing and directing no, project. It, but people love the movie. I know. So apparently did a good job. I, I like Leif Schreiber. I like Leif Schreiber too. I'm pulling for him. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 100% cotton. I wish I was interested. 100 I'm I'm all about 100% cotton baby. I wish I was more interested <laughs> in uh, Ray Donovan, but I'm just not. Yeah, neither am I. Yeah. Big 100% cotton fan? 110%. <laughs> oh, that's very good. Um, <laughs> oh, natural. <laughs> uh, yeah, so didn't watch the movie. But yeah, uh, yeah. that and uh, the fact that like, there, there are things that, like, it's so quirky. Did you ever see the movie Little Miss Sunshine? Yes. Where it's like, oh, Alan Arkin's Again, crotchety grandpa the- and uh, uh, Steve Carell is, mm-hmm. like, funny, but he's also suicidal. Also Uh-oh. sad. That was a big thing back then. Funny and sad. Yeah, totally. Yeah. But, like, it, it, like the and fact particu- that... In particular, suicidal, I feel like. Like yeah. in, um, what's it called? The Royal Tenenbaums. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Although, Royal Tenenbaums. Wait, I just realized he's not so funny. Royal Tenenbaums is a cut above. Oh, I love I haven't it. seen that movie in a long Me time. Me neither, but, but that, the last one I saw, I fucking loved it. It's what it. I used to rank as my favorite movie. It'd be weird to, to look at it. Yeah. I have not seen it in years. Yeah, I haven't either. It was definitely one of my favorite movies. Wait, what? There's another, you know what, never mind, it'd be boring, of, of me on air thinking, what Wes Anderson wow. movie is like my favorite movie? Uh, Actually, you know what? Life Aquatic might be my favorite. Oh, I love the Life I, Aquatic. Yeah. Uh, the, early, also, the early 2000s do have an identity. It's weird. It's, that's what I was. I, was um, I feel so close do. to it. I still feel very, very like part of it. I was trying to think of Until why? you think about what was going on back then and realize like, oh no, I'm not in that. 
Like, what do you mean? I, like I don't I I I feel like I brought a lot of that stuff with me, right? Mm-hmm. Like I I I read, you know, all the books that I loved that were mm-hmm. from the early 2000s that are part of this sort of like subculture of uh melancholy melancholy hopeful yeah stuff. Uh, like I, I, I watched all that and I loved that and it probably yeah. and I, I do think it became a part of me yeah. going forward. But like, it's funny. I didn't think that the two thousands had their own identity because I'm from there. Pop But looking back at it, it's like no, we left all that behind. Like that's all still there, and I'm not there anymore. Right. Like I mean, Brittany and jo- I almost said Brittany and Jonathan because of the book. Yeah, you know, like Brittany and Jonathan, <laughs> what it was like for them. We all know the story of Brittany and Jonathan. There's almost nothing to say. Um, Br- <laughs> Brittany and Justin's denim matching outfits. That's early 2000s. Yeah, melancholy, There's, hopeful. Yes, yeah. exactly. Mm-hmm. There's a very popular um, Instagram and Twitter and like everything account called Pop Culture Died in 2009. Where they just read, um, post and retweet like old um, tabloid things from the early 2000s <laughs> because it was like an insane era. Really? Yeah. I mean, like all of Paris Hilton stuff. Yeah, true. Um, Britney stuff. When Paris Hilton, Britney, and Lindsay were a team. Um, like there's just like a lot of stuff. And as I said, early 2000s music is great. But then, I, but then what makes you wonder is that if it was just great. Well, no, I wasn't really having that great a time in the early 2000s, actually. Because I was going to say, was that like my heyday and like my high school experience where people are like, you would have been oh, 17. high school are the best years of my life. You would have been 17. You would have been just at the end of high school when 2000 came when around. Two th- yes. Yeah. I graduated in 2002. So I was yeah. like 16, 17. Yeah. I was 16 going on <laughs> 17, baby. It was so fun. Oh, wow. <laughs> Pardon the interruption. Book Club Schmuck Club has no sponsors, so instead we rely on our listeners and patrons. If you enjoy the show, please consider going to patreon.com slash talkbomb to help us cover our hosting fees and book fees and to get dozens of Patreon-exclusive shows as a thank you. Please also consider leaving us a review on iTunes or Stitcher to brighten our day and maintain our show's reputation. If you like Book Club Schmuck Club, the best thing you can do for us is to share the show with a friend. If you like this podcast, there's a good chance your friends will too. No matter what, we just hope you enjoy the show, though. So let's get back into it. Yeah, but what I was going to say was that one of the things that I expected would annoy me more Mm -hmm. because it's so over the top, quirky, Mm -hmm. so perfectly, perfectly, pristinely quirky. Mm -hmm. Alex's grandfather, who's going to be their driver, Uh is blind. Yeah. But he's the driver. What are you kidding? (laughs) I would think that. And his seeing eye dog is named Sammy Davis Jr. Jr. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep, and Borat calls her like uh, she's his seeing, seeing eye, eye bitch. bitch. Yeah, and it's like it's so it's so close to annoying me, mm-hmm. but it doesn't. Well, I say I say it with that like comedic edge because I feel like I feel like it is, especially looking back on it, like so like perfectly set up for like comedic moments mm-hmm. where somebody can go like, "What? You're blind? The blind guy's the driver?" <laughs> Yep. Like I feel like it is set up for like a moment like that, but that never really hit me in that quite quite in that way. Mm-hmm. And instead it just became part of like okay, just part of like the tapestry that mm-hmm. we're weaving here. This is just sort of like a madcap yeah. world. It actually set more of a tone that I was able to get into mm-hmm. instead of being uh instead of being annoyed by. I which I'm see surprised. That. I'm surprised I was not annoyed by it. But what's what's the deal with that? What's going on? Why does grandpa think he's blind, but he's gonna drive the car? I don't understand what's going on. I don't I don't know. I wonder if there's an answer in the in the sphere of like, you know, dissecting literature. I don't really think so. Right? Like he's ignoring his past. Oh, oh, like th- oh I see. Thematically. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I, I don't I thought you meant like going back there'd be something in the book. Uh, yeah, perhaps. Yeah, could be. he's blind. He's yeah. he's literally like closing himself off to yeah. what's going on around him. Could be. I don't know, but he he is the driver. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. And and Sammy Davis Jr. Jr. the seeing eye bitch doesn't yeah. really do much of anything. It's actually kind of gross. Yeah, totally yeah. gross. She keeps trying to she mack keeps on Jonathan. Getting carnal with Jonathan. Yeah. Most carnal. Yeah, he's most carnal. <laughs> 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 and also the seeing eye bitch thing isn't as annoying as it would seem um, immediately. I be- agree. Well, also because... I just I end up liking it. Alex, like, doesn't mean it, like, funny, cool. Like, just in his language, like, you know, yeah, bitch is a, bitch, a female, female dog. dog. Yeah, yeah, so it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone who was less skilled than Jonathan Safran Foer at mm-hmm. writing this, it would it would bug me. Mm-hmm. Totally. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, did you find, for me, going, like, reading the book... 
it toggles between three things, but mm-hmm. really it toggles between, to my eye, two things. Yeah, yeah, it, basically. It's the Jonathan Safran Foer slash Alex and Grandpa and mm-hmm. Sammy Davis Jr. Jr. story. Mm-hmm. And it's the Jonathan Safran Foer is writing his ancestors' lives. Totally. Just story. structurally, it's three. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, it's definitely two. When we bounce back and <laughs> forth between the two things, did you find yourself being like, oh, good, we're in flashback? Or, oh, good, we're more in the present? Sometimes. In the beginning, I was enjoying the flashback. I liked Broad. Like, I liked yeah. the stuff involving Broad. So at that point, I liked it when we would go back to the flashback. Yeah. As we got further in time, and it was more about Saffron and stuff, then I wasn't as into the flashbacks. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I completely agree. The mm-hmm. story of Broad, which was Jonathan Saffron Forward's great, 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 great grandmother. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, I don't know how many greats. She was found in a river. Yeah. And then uh, through the a lottery, mm-hmm. they gave her to a man named Yankel. Yeah. Who became her father, mm-hmm. adoptive father mm-hmm. this was one of the first things yeah that, like it, it's one of the first things that happens in the book and it very quickly pushed me to the edge where i was like i like i feel like i'm pretty emotionally stable yeah uh but uh man <laughs> william i've never been able to say that <laughs> uh hey maybe that's true <laughs> yeah uh but yeah it was it was for sure uh pushing my buttons oy, 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 oy. yeah a lot because he's like an old man who has a baby. Ugh. Yeah, was an old man who has a baby yeah. and uh, his wife left him. Mm-hmm. She left him a note that said, I have to do this for me mm-hmm. or something like that. Yeah, something like that. And he never understood why she would leave that note. And, and like, she left it really casually, like this, like in the same place that she'd leave a note being like, hey, pick up bread when you're out. Like there was no ceremony to the note. It was just so yeah. like banal and just another day so that his whole world changed. And he would uh, and he would constantly like study the note to try to see like is there any hesitation in the writing? Yeah. Anything that suggests that it was a hard note for her to write, mm-hmm. but no. Yeah. It was just I have to do this for me, goodbye. Yeah. And gone and out of his life. And now he's got this kid. Yeah. And as she started to grow up, mm-hmm. he made up a life mm-hmm. uh that he lived with a woman. Mm-hmm. So basically so the girl's name is Broad, named after this river that she yeah. was found in. Mm-hmm. And uh, he tells her about her mother, mm-hmm. who he doesn't know. No one knows who yeah. her parents were yeah. originally. But he tells her that uh, he is her father, mm-hmm. like biologically. And uh, uh, he and her mother were in love. And look at all these notes that your mother used to write to me. Yeah. And they were all like love letters. Yeah. You know, and uh, he found himself falling in love with this mm-hmm. person that never existed. Right. That he made up out of thin air. Mm-hmm. And at night, he would reread his own letters that he wrote to himself and start to feel like he really had created this woman in his head. That he would wake up in the middle of the night and feel like she must have just gotten out of bed because there's no one on the other side of the bed. And uh, The shit killed me. It is, it is so, it, it is so beautifully written and yes. heartbreaking. And it almost makes you happy on a strange level. Yeah, because it's so sweet. But it's, it's also just like so devastating. Yeah. Oh, I, I it, all the Yankel stuff made me cry. Yeah, like that the letter thing, and then the thing that I was talking about in the beginning, which is that as he was getting older. <clears throat> excuse me, I'm not crying. I have a uh, schmutz in my throat. Ew, <laughs> schmutzy throat. <coughs> That's disgusting. <laughs> I know. I wish I hadn't said that. I'm sorry. I guess I was in like a Yiddish moment because we're using all these words. <laughs> well, that's weird. You have talked about how you are like you do adopt the <laughs> traits of people that you talk to and stuff. Before. Yeah, because I'm a sociopath. Yeah. Um, well, but also um, mom in particular, but mom and dad, like they use a lot of Yiddish words when we were gr- growing yeah, up. Yeah, that's true. You know, so that's yeah. that's actually not part of that, I don't think. But well, maybe it is because we're talking about this, this right now. It's just funny. Yeah. yeah. Um, like, uh, I'm trying to think what, no, no, I can't think of anything. What's like a weird word that mom would use? I mean, definitely. Uh, Michigas, schmutz. (laughs) Michigas, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, anyway, so, um, shit was, oh, okay, okay. So, um, so yeah, the uh, other thing that got me really upset where I was like really like crying was that as he was getting older, his memory was starting to go. So he wrote down things on the walls of his room that he wanted to make sure that he remembered so that Broad wouldn't know that he was starting to like lose his mental capacity a little bit. And just like the sweetness of wanting to go to that effort to like 
preserve her life stuff and also the things that he wrote wrote were really sweet just like i feel like tears starting right now about like things that they like to do together and like and saying you know yankel loves broad that was written on the ceiling but then uh after he dies it starts to chip off and the little flux of like lipstick fall into the room yeah and she finds him dead you know there was like there's like a festival they have and she was dressed up like a mermaid and was excited to do something with him and came home and the house was silent. Yeah, it's it's so affecting and so well written and maybe because it's us, but I feel like because you're anybody with a heart, it gets to you. And uh, yeah, really incredible. Like shocking too. And then like it cuts and it's fucking Borat being like, <laughs> I feel like that is one of those moments where he's like, hey, why are you writing these stories about your ancestors that are so sad? Yeah. Like if you if you're already exaggerating what they did and what happened to them and fictionalizing real events, why don't you make their lives happier? Yeah. And it was, it was, it was, it was, that was another thing that I was like, am I going to be annoyed by this or what? Because I like, it's one thing to like write that, to write like those actual events, like um, Broad finding her father dead. Yeah. But it's another thing to then have somebody in the book be like, I don't know about how that was written. Like that's so meta. Mm-hmm. That's so like, it, and it's it's meant it's doing what it's exactly meant to do. It takes you out of the book. It like elevates your consciousness above the events that you're reading that you're getting so engrossed in mm-hmm. to critiquing those pages. But I. I, I don't know. I couldn't tell if I was annoyed by that or if I sort of admired it because it mm. was so emotional. And then yeah. it allows you this sort of like uh, moment to rest mm-hmm. basically yeah. by by so like uh, jerkily pulling you out of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It gives you sort of like a sanctuary from that like highly emotional story. Yeah, totally. But then, he, I mean, he'll put you right back in it later. Yeah. <laughs> Well, except I found that later I was able to get a little bit more distance from it because um, I was reminded later that she was going home to – she had a date with her father to eat pineapple, which I found weird. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's also like it's like the 1700s and like a little s- shtetl. <laughs> I was about to say. It like, I mean, I like, you know, I like get it. Yeah. But she's like – well, even this is fucked up and sad. But it was where it kept coming up and I was like – I'm having a lot of conflicting feelings here right now. She uh, is coming home from – like the festival thing where she's the mermaid that Will was just talking about and on her way home. And this is also a little time jumpy thing, which confused me. Yeah. Um, okay. So I'm getting away from my main point, but I kind of have to, to, to talk about this part. So there's a part which is like more of like a dream, like kind of thing. And Yankel's still alive. I think at this part, and I guess it's a dream or something. I don't know. What bro- but broad is looking out of the window with a telescope and she can see through the walls of another house into the book that these two kids are reading in the house. And the book has a chapter or something that says like, uh, like the terrible rape of broad. And, and so you, I don't know how he phrased it, but like you get the sense that like, that's real. Like that's something that's going to be coming. And she has that sense too. Yeah. So then, and, and maybe it says something like on the way home from the festival or something like you kind of like, well, maybe I'm wrong. I don't it's like know. a does disassociative it state. It does. It does. Like say when that. it is. Okay. Yeah I, yeah. I think that's right. So yeah, it's either a disassociative sort of state, but also, I mean, like it's 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 you know, it's multiple things because it's also Jonathan Safran Foer, the character writing this right. sort of like uh, you know floaty surreal. So wait, do you mean disassociative? History? Like sh- that chapter was happening like while she was being raped or something. Maybe, maybe that's the way that, that he's suggesting that she dissected it uh-huh. is through like making it distant. Yeah, she has to see it with a telescope. It's huh. in someone else's hands. That would make sense. It just doesn't make sense in the timeline. No, well, the timeline is the timeline yeah. is all over the place. It is anyway. Even within the same chapter, where it'll be like timeline of the past thing, still in the past, it jumps around yeah. in time. So it is tricky. So I don't know. But anyway, um, so yeah, so. Well, yes. Anyway, okay. Because I, I was getting confused about what I thought happened when. Anyway, so she is walking home when this guy rapes her, and she is like, and you know, he's a creep. Like they talk about how he's like so- soft Yoka, who's like constantly yeah. masturbating or something like that. So you like, you know, he's like weird. And um, she's like, I have to get home. I'm I have plans to eat pineapple with my father. 
And that's horrible, but I was also like, yeah. this is so weird. Like, you have plans to eat <laughs> pineapple with your father? Like, not just, like, dinner or snack? Like, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. pineapple plans. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I agree. I, I Like, so much of it, it like... It, but like it's that was a quaint time. You I know. know. I mean? Like it, it makes, but for some but reason, it, it's specific to the pineapple. I think it's weird to me that you have a date to go home and eat pineapple. Oh, totally. Yeah. But like, is it? I, I think it is. You know, I mean, it is that it's a quaint time. But is it also that like Jonathan Safran Foer wants there to be like all these dissonant elements where it's like something horrible yeah, is happening so. right now, but also here's this sort of like weird, detail. very small, strange intricate plan yeah like like it, it i i feel like everything that happens in the book mm-hmm. is so so real and so unreal simultaneously yeah yeah that it's it's just very tricky to navigate mm-hmm. and like I, th- I think that that's the kind of stuff that it's like like i walked away from it being really interested in it and really impressed by it and really liking it mm-hmm. and also being very like emotionally twisted yeah like i feel like i it it like puts you through the ringer yeah because you you you're just never on like solid ground yeah you never really understand what's happening or how you're supposed to feel yeah it's very confusing it's very confusing even like so like they do like the 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 big time jump because jonathan saffron forward is writing this story about like you know generations of his Mm -hmm. ancestors but basically basically we go from (laughs) basically basically we're gonna go from the past to the future here's the thing (laughs) We go from Broad to then going to his grandfather, mm-hmm. pretty much. Like, mm-hmm. there's stuff in between. Yeah. But, and, like, I guess when she gets older with her husband. Yeah, yeah. But, like, but like really no an- no relatives between her and then just jump to his grandfather. Totally. But that story is really weird in, like, another way where it's, like, it's it feels so much more like just, like, a, a rando's adventures. Yes, very much so. Like, like the adventures, adventures of this weird scamp guy. Yeah, it's, it feels disconnected. Yeah, he has. Like, it feels kind of like a different book. Like all of a sudden, totally it's like does. kind of body. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, it weird. was body the whole time. Like there were. Uh yeah. There were always well, doing it references. Doing it references, but this was almost like, um, like Gonzo ish. You know yeah. what I mean? That this guy's got like a lame dead. Like arm. Gonzo and Camilla. <laughs> <laughs> No, but like th- this guy's got like a, a lame arm that yeah. like all the women want him to do them with. Like it's weird. It it's is like really gross, weird. cartoonish. Well, he was born with teeth. This is where you're just like. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like it just feels totally different. Well, not to- I mean, it's still the same tone, but like when you think about it, this story is very different and strange. It's very bizarre. I wonder how much of this is in the movie. I bet it's just like a five minute thing with like polka music behind it. Well, this is a really weird. St- I bet you're right. <laughs> Yeah, I bet you're one hundred percent right. Um, but, um, but, um. And he's like, Grandpa Saffron had an interesting talent. And he's like know? looking at some lady who's hanging sheets on like a, a dryer line. What is the, what is that called? Like hanging a sheets line? to dry. Yeah. yeah. Boop, 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 boop. And then we it's see like, like zany. their silhouettes going into like a bedroom. They close the door, <laughs> yeah. and then we just cut back to the present. Yeah. <laughs> We're like, all right, we know everything we need to know about yeah, him. Totally, <laughs> we got everything from that. <laughs> oh, I don't like a baby born with teeth. No, that's so weird. But like, <laughs> what a weird story this is. So like, so like, think about it this way: this story is ostensibly mm-hmm. at its most at its most basic. It's about Jonathan Safran Foer traveling to where is this? It's like on the border of Poland and yeah, something. It's in the Ukraine. Yeah, traveling to the yeah. Ukraine, and with the help of a guide, he's going to try to figure out about his family history. Right. Right. But then there's the, like this all, all this other mishmash stuff yeah. I, that I liked. Yeah. But like it's so it so doesn't really amount to anything. Yeah. Necessarily. I mean, it's part of the book, and I have more to say about it. But like, you could just do, and from what I understand, the movie does do just the story of Jonathan mm-hmm. Safran Foer traveling through the Ukraine and learning stuff about the past, right. rather than being like, all right, now we're going to go to the past and we're going to see these events, right? Because he's what he's trying to do is find the woman mm-hmm. who he believes saved his grandfather mm-hmm. from being killed during the Holocaust. Mm-hmm. We, by the end of this thing, we don't meet his grandfather. We don't hear any stories about his grandfather right. after the the after World War II begins. When I was writing the summary, I was like, did I miss how Augustine saved Saffron? It's not in there. No, it's it, not. No, it's not yeah. in the story. Um, so the thing that he sets out to do, he, from what we can tell at least, he does And we does, never meet Augustine in the past, P.S., right? We don't. No. We meet another yeah. woman right. who uh, can tell us a similar story. Mm-hmm. Right. And I feel like that's a big thing, too, is like mm-hmm. very like 
similar stories. Jonathan Safran Foer himself is not that big a character in this book. I was about to say that. Like, the way that the book starts, you think that Alex is going to be kind of like an entry point to this story about Jonathan Safran Foer. But he's going to be like, you're kind of fun tour guide on this story a little bit here and there. Yeah. But no, it's really, Alex is a bigger character in the book than Jonathan. 100%. And Jonathan Safran Foer is seen as just sort of like, the he's he's like the 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 motor mm-hmm. he's the engine that gets this story going mm-hmm. but he's really not a, yeah. a great big part of it yeah B- huge events happen once he leaves the room mm-hmm. you know like like totally it's kind of not a, a, about him but no, it's not really it's weird because I'm trying to figure out what the parallel is we eventually learn so um, Alex's grandfather the blind driver mm-hmm. um, during the Holocaust sold out one of his friends. Mm-hmm. The Nazis came to their village and they, uh, at gunpoint, asked people to tell them which people in town are Jewish. Mm -hmm. And when it came to uh, Alex's grandfather, whose name is also Alex, um, and was friends with this guy, Harold? Uh, Herschel. Herschel. He was Herschel's only friend. Mm -hmm. No one else even knew about Herschel. No one knew Herschel. No one knew Herschel was Jewish. Shit was heartbreaking. They get to, um, to the grandfather and they say... Uh, point out a Jew, mm-hmm. and he points out Herschel, like p- pretty much right away, mm-hmm. without hesitation. And Herschel's dragged away, screaming. You know, tell them that you tell them that you lied because you were worried that they would shoot you. You like save me. And we learn Herschel did it to save his own family, mm-hmm. to save his wife, to save his son. No, uh, what's his name? Did it, uh, Alex? Oh, sorry, yeah, Alex yeah, yeah. did it to save his own family. Mm-hmm. Which, you know, then means that narrator Alex, our new Borat, mm-hmm. is is able to to be born and mm-hmm. become the narrator of our story. And older Alex, grandpa, mm-hmm. has lived with this for his whole life. Mm-hmm. And it has just sort of destroyed him. Mm-hmm. Um, and his son, his grandson's father, mm-hmm. uh, is like abusive and and... A bully, yeah, and just like a horrible person, and eventually, the lesson that we're going to be left with is make your life your own. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, older Alex, grandpa, eventually kills himself so that uh, younger Alex can like sever all ties to everything that came before, mm-hmm. which is so like taking that and comparing it to the Jonathan Safran Foer story. Jonathan Safran Foer is obsessed with the past, right? Like, he's taking the past and turning them into these sort of, like, bigger mythical figures, which is also, like, it, on the one hand, it could be paying respect to everybody that came before, but on the other hand, it could be the actual act of making them not real. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, dis- distancing. Yeah. Um, turning them into something that they never were. Mm. Like, he's given artifacts from this woman, uh, like a little box that has like little artifacts and stuff. And they talk about how uh, a lot of people during the Holocaust would bury things like their wedding rings Mm -hmm. so that there would at least be some sort of evidence that they ever existed at all. Mm -hmm. And he, um, the shit is so sad. It's really, it's really, yeah. Um, and he seems like he's like really invested in that, but I feel like he's also very distant from it. Like, I feel like he's interested in the past as sort of a, a, a means to, like, digest the story a little bit and, mm-hmm. and maybe move on. Mm-hmm. I don't know. And then, and then we end the entire book on Alex's grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> Man, this podcast sucks. No, I think it's a good podcast. It's just <laughs> no. it's not easy. It's not easy to – it's not easy to be comfortable and – talk because like i don't think that we i think that we if we were to take a break and try to compose ourselves we would just be right here again so we may as well just go for it but like the idea of like killing yourself as the act of like saving someone else is so like fucked up and not correct and it's something that people who are depressed like that's what they actually think and i get that but it's hard for that to be where the book ends because it, it, it leaves you on a note where you're like, it, it's supposed to sort of feel, I mean, literally it's interrupted, right? Like the grandfather's suicide note is literally interrupted where he says like, I forget what the actual thing is, but he's like, um, and now I will. Yeah. It's yeah. It's now I will. 
and then the his note ends and the book ends. And so it's literally severing that tie mm-hmm. for from what came before for uh Alex Borat mm-hmm. and us as the readers where it's like okay this is over. Like this is done and now now we go on and do our own thing. So it's weirdly about not taking the baggage of the past with you. Mm-hmm. Uh yeah. and Alex is like mythologizing the past. So mm-hmm. I don't I don't I don't know what to think about it. And that's yeah. the thing where I'm like when I said that I found this book confusing and like it just kind of like twists you mm. a little bit. Like I walked away from it not really knowing how I felt, but I felt like I feel right now where yeah. I'm just kind of like, yeah, hey, I'm crying. And I don't really I, – I, like I can tell you in some words why I'm crying. Mm-hmm. Like I, I don't find the subject of suicide very easy to discuss mm. or depression or any of that. But I also am just like confused because I thought that it was a really like – terrific book that told a story that is so strange Mm -hmm. and impossible to pin down that I have to recommend it because I mean, how frequently have we, have we ever read a book on this show that has like gotten this reaction, any reaction like this out of us? Mm -mm. I think it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Uh, And because I really do think that it's going to be something that is like I will like have to keep it with me and I will have to go back through it Mm -hmm. at some point because I don't know what the hell happened. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) I have no idea why any of the things that happened in the book happen. And I feel like there is a reason. Like I feel like there is, uh, you know, like you can you can some some things you're not rewarded for trying to dissect the crazy Mm -hmm. things that happen in it. And uh, some things actually are like everything is intentional. Yeah. And I feel like everything in this book is intentional outside mm-hmm. of like Sammy Davis Jr. Jr. Uh, Grandpa is blind, but he's the driver. <laughs> uh, Borat. We have a, a proto Borat. <laughs> um, I wonder what came first, the chicken or the egg? Uh, yeah, I know. Which Borat? Which Borat was the earliest? Let's see. Hold on. Yeah, let's do a little Borat. Let's, let's live in the mood. Let's yeah. do a little Borat research. Yeah. Because Borat came from the Ali G show. Mm-hmm. Although, you know what? Is there probably just like a wiki about the character of Borat? Um, I bet there is. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Wiki.Borat. We can learn his whole history. The movie, okay. Borat, the British American mockumentary comedy film, came out in 2006. 2006. And this book was written in 2002. 2002. But Borat, the character, existed before the movie came out for years. Yeah, but what about the writing of the book? True. <laughs> right? Like, True. That is what I'm, I'm curious okay, about. Okay, the Ali G show is from 2000 to 2004, it just said. Oh. Uh-oh. That's right around the same time. Well, you know what? Maybe it's one of those things. Borat. Okay, here we go. Borat Sag, Sagjev. Sag, yeah. Is a satirical character created and performed by Sasha Baron Cohen. When was he born? Do we have like a birthday or some For nonsense? Borat? Here? Yeah. You know, um, you know what I mean? Where it it's like, what's Sasha Mickey Baron- Mouse's birthday? Oh, yes. Yes. 1972. Up there. What? Born 14, February 27th, 1972. Okay. Well, that's like. Oh, I oh I understand what you're saying. Never mind. The character <laughs> was. This is what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The character yeah, gotcha. was first developed for short skits on F2F on Granada uh, Television. In 1996. With the character at this time being known as Alexi. Whoa! Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. The character now known as Christo. (laughs) Is that a mistake? I'd like to go look up some uh, Christo sketches. I forgot that he has a child named Huey Lewis. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's the same as Sammy Davis Jr. Jr. What is going on oh, here? Wait, There's a conspiracy. Wait just a goddamn second. I'm going to get to the bottom of this. I don't give a fuck who's at the top. Interesting. When was the first mention of Huey Lewis? <laughs> because we know for sure now that Borat as Alexi came first. Yeah. Huey Lewis was definitely mentioned in the movie, but he may have been mentioned on the Ali G show for all we know. Yeah, he might have been. Who boy. Who? Huey Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I uh I have no idea. Hmm. It seems like Borat came first. I think Borat <laughs> came first. I'm sorry to say. Uh, <laughs> I'm not. Borat doesn't touch my heart nearly as much. 
But uh, he does in a different way. Borat's really affected me in my life, I suppose. Does he? I think Borat's really funny. Like the movie. Have you have you seen that in recent years? No. Ryan and I watched it like, I mean, not that like in the last like I think probably in the last year, and it was really funny. Like not as funny as it was at the time, but it largely held up in a way, and I didn't expect it to. The full name of the movie is Borat. Cultural Learnings of America for Make Benefit Glorious Nation of Kazakhstan. <laughs> That's the name of that movie. It's a good name. Um, I've mentioned this on the show before, I'm sure, but shit. I... I think Jonathan Safran Foer ripped off Borat. I think he did. <laughs> um, <laughs> does that make any of this less poignant? Should we suck any tears back into our faces? Uh, yeah, now I feel a little worse about crying. <laughs> Um, what was I going to say? Oh, I had a boss who uh, closed work early for the day and still paid us, and we went to see Borat. That's awesome. Yeah, totally. It was a boss who was like Michael Scott. It was unbelievable. It was one of those things you really couldn't make up. Oh, wow. I was he definitely... also in the theater? Like, did you look over and he was sitting there? Too? Yes. Oh, 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 wait, oh so wait. you all went to see Yes. It. My entire office, he paid for us to all go see Borat. Wait a minute. <laughs> Wait, what what job was this? It was the last office job that I had right before I went to cosmetology school. Oh, okay. When All I right. worked, I was a receptionist for um, a public relations company for healthcare. Yeah. And it was an office, I mean, uh, office job. It was an awesome job. Like, I went into it knowing that I was only going to be in it for a short time because I knew I was going to go to cosmetology school, which I obviously didn't tell them. Right. But, um... I almost put off going to cosmetology school because I was like, shit, I really like this place. But I was also like, I have to get started on my real life. Shit, sometimes <laughs> this guy takes me to see Borat. <laughs> what would you have done so, if he was like, all right, guys, we're going to go home again. We can leave early again because I want to see it a second time. <laughs> Who's ready for round two? <laughs> Wait, I'd go. Do you think he did uh, it when, again when Bruno came out? <laughs> I'm not sure. I don't know if Bruno had the same cachet by that point. But it was unbelievable <laughs> because at this office, we would um, all have lunch together on Fridays, which was catered by the company. I would um, order it and pick it up and everything as my job as receptionist. And we would watch an episode of The Office together in the conference room that one of my coworkers had recorded the night before. And it was amazing, but also weird because our boss was so much like Michael Scott, like yeah. so, so much down to the Borat obsession that he would be, he would sometimes be in and out. I don't think he sat and watched every episode with us, but we would kind of be uncomfortable sometimes. Like, how is blank not like getting this right now because the michael come, scotts don't know he came by my they desk all the time and he'd be like beauty school drop out like when i gave my two weeks notice for going to cosmetology school it's like and, wait i'm going to beauty school yeah i know exactly <laughs> and one time he started to come to the desk and i was like yeah no J- uh J- jocko not his name right. yeah yeah no i know beauty school dropout and he was like all right get to work will you okay like he got pissy like michael scott would be when you called him on it it was unbelievable <laughs> The Michael Scotts don't know. They just think they're but funny. Even when literally faced with Michael Scott, it was abs- It was uncomfortable. Sometimes. I'll give you another one. They love Michael Scott. <laughs> Did you have experience with this? I I'm vaguely aware of Michael Scott characters. Okay, and they seem to love it. Interesting. And they don't love it ironic. They they love it genuinely the way yeah, that we yeah, love it. They yeah. they just they know that he's being stupid. They know yeah. that Michael Scott is being a clown. That people don't like Michael Scott. Totally. They just think that they themselves are actually funny. Right. Right. Absolutely. That's the thing. I think that that guy didn't watch it with us. Really, I think he would come in the conference room and get his lunch and then, like go in his office or something. Um, so I don't think there was ever a moment where it was really where we were like, oh, my God, I'm dying. He's sitting right there. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it was like you couldn't make it up, really. Oh, that's crazy. That's that's it really – I wonder if that company went out of business. No. Catered lunches every Friday? No. Actually, I have to go on LinkedIn because one of my friends from work added me on LinkedIn not that long ago. I just never go on there, but I got the email and I was like, holy shit, Elliot Harrison. He's like the best. Wow, weird. Yeah. Cool. It was, it was seriously the best job I've ever had besides like the salon wow. and my current job. Like as far as like my office jobs and things before, that was like such a great job. Did you never think about going back? No, I haven't. Just because I worked at the salon until right. The job that I'm working at now came up. Yeah, true. No, so no, I hadn't. But it was like, I have nothing but incredibly fond memories of that job. It was amazing. Wow, that's yeah. really wild. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you should go work there. It's great. Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> I would say you like your job, too, so that's good. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Uh, cool. All yeah. right. Well, I recommend uh, Everything is Illuminated. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, I think it's complicated. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yep. But I, I also think it's really good. Yeah. I think it's a really good book. I think it's really interesting and i think that as much as i like it now 
if I were, what would I have been? If I were 16, 17 mm-hmm. and I read this, holy cramoli. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I would have loved it. Yeah. Uh, even more. Yeah, totally. Yeah, cool. <laughs> even more, even if you can more. believe it. Any <laughs> Any final thoughts? Is there, any, is there anything that we didn't bring up that we should bring up? There's a lot of stuff going on in this I know, book. Like, there are plot details that we didn't touch on. Completely. But, but I think we got our, our feelings we, about the yes, book Yes, I think there. we did. I don't think, I don't think I have anything else to say, really, in particular. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. You know what? Can I just, can I just highlight a weird uh, yes. thing that's in the book? Always. So it, the, the, the mechanism of being able to like, look back at the past and mm-hmm. tell the story of, a, a, of an ancestor mm-hmm. is kind of uh, Jonathan Safran Foer's like, free reign to, to go big and broad and write whatever you want. Mm-hmm. So broad. We, broad. Mm-hmm. B-R-O-D. Yep. Well, he writes a story about Broad, mm-hmm. his great, 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 great grandmother, mm-hmm. when she grew up and got married to the Krampus, whatever his name was. <laughs> the Kolker. The Kolker. Yeah. And how one day he was out at work and there was an accident. Yeah. And two men came to this the house. Was pretty crazy. To tell her about the accident. They're like, he didn't feel a thing. And mm-hmm. she was like, you know, screaming, crying because her husband's dead. And they go, no, he's not dead. Mm-hmm. He didn't die. Yeah. He's got a uh, spinning saw blade lodged in his head. Mm-hmm. And he survived. And he's, he seems to be perfectly fine. Yeah. He'll just have that saw blade in his head for the rest of his life. And that's the story. Yeah. <laughs> like that's like it gets it gets pretty I'm about to say not nutty. entirely the story well but, but in terms of like yeah. the thing that's like physically impossible like yes. that's like the sort of like free reign like where it's yeah. like just to highlight yeah. when he talks about stuff some of it is physically impossible and definitely never happened well how much of the saw blade is in his head because i mean sometimes people live with like weird shit in their bodies right i yeah i guess that's true so i i didn't think of that story as physically impossible really Oh boy, I really did. I, I mean, it, it seemed, felt very, it seemed very to me. Again, again broad. It was very out there. But I think that a smaller version of that could happen because the part of the story is that the um, saw blade is in his head, and then he becomes like kind of like almost Tourette'sy and abusive. Yeah. And it is true that some people who have injuries to certain parts of their brain, it changes their personality. Yeah. So it, you know, it wouldn't happen in the, well, who the hell knows? I don't think it would happen in the same way that it happens in the book, which seems a little bit more blown out. Yeah. But like, you know, there's a kernel of truth in there. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. Well, you just poked a hole in that. Yeah, well, yeah, I was I mean, thinking may- about it as being they really it as, out there. Maybe they just dis- well, I mean, kind of what happens is pretty out there. But maybe they describe the saw thing in his head as being bigger or something maybe. that I'm remembering, where it is like that could not be. But like you know, people like live with like four, you know, like a tiny thing in their yeah, body. That I can't mean, get that's out. for sure true. Yeah. Uh, when he dies, they encase his body in bronze that is and make so him a sweet. statue. Yeah. And people kiss the statue and like. They have to rebronze it because the bronze is wearing away. Yeah, bronze, bronze. <laughs> <laughs> but like, that's crazy. Like, yeah, that, it's awesome. Is that something that happens? Uh, no, that that no. All right, no, I don't think so. <laughs> so I'm second guessing everything. I think I, I think that technically things that could happen may not be real and. Things that definitely never happen. I'm like, did that happen? Yeah. Like, I'm just like, a, I'm like, he's got me all topsy turvy. <laughs> <laughs> Up is down, black is white. Cats and dogs living together. Mass hysteria. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, that I don't think that happens. And then, uh, like, people like rubbed it and touched it so much that like saffron. Like doesn't he, he's confused or something because he's like I thought I had a resemblance to the guy, this guy but I really don't but it's just because the brass is warped or yeah. something yeah <laughs> he like the 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 physique that they modeled around the corpse yeah he has like big forearms and stuff and yeah. so he's like oh I want to be like that I want to look like that guy yeah and then it starts like wearing away and he's like oh I look nothing like that guy <laughs> or something like that it's like so it's not exactly that but it's something yeah, it's, like that it's really weird totally you know what this reminded me of it reminded me a lot of big fish. You ever oh, see I didn't and think or about read that, Big Fish? Big Fish is a book? Oh, yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Did yeah. you read it? Uh, yeah, a long time ago. Oh, God. It reminds me of Big Fish and that it fucking killed me. Yeah, why don't we take like five years off before we ever read Big Fish? Because God. I know what Big Fish does There's to me. There's absolutely... And it will be worse now. No way <laughs> in hell I'm reading Big Fish. How do you feel about crying on the show? Oh, I feel I feel a little weird about it now that it's happened. I'm kind of okay with it. Right. I will say it's the second time I've cried here in two weeks. That's true. There's an unaired show last week where I cried the whole time. Yeah, that's gone. Yeah. That's just gone. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I don't think I've ever cried on the show. I cried on Little Bobby either. at least once, uh-huh. I think. Yeah. 
No, well, I haven't yeah, I either. I have cried on this. I mean, I didn't much care for it, but I'm kind of okay with it. Yeah, I think you were fine. Did I seem at least dignified? Yes. I didn't lose my dignity? No, I think you held on to your dignity. Okay. I don't think I audibly... I just, I'm not going to listen back to this one. <laughs> fuck, no. I already thought that. I was like, I'm never listening to this. Yeah. Um, I don't think I audibly talked, cried. I think I got quiet and I sniffed a lot, but I was, I was tears were rolling. Yeah. 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 No, I think you were okay. Okay. Yeah. All right, cool. Yeah. I uh, hope you guys out there feel yeah, all hope, right. hope you had fun. I'm actually curious to, to hear, because I think that you and I... I to think that hear? you and I to listen to it no 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 i'm curious oh, to hear oh. what, what people think of this oh episode. i kind of am too i think that you and i have a pretty solid track record of going through emotionally awful things together <laughs> and ending up all right on the other side yes so i'm not worried for us or anything i'm curious what it is like for people to listen to this yeah, is it o- oxys yeah, you know, like yeah. I, I wonder, I just wonder. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, out there listening, if you enjoyed this episode, let me know. If you mm-hmm. don't enjoy this episode, never tell me. Keep it to yourself. Just no, this to is yourself. way too personal. Exactly. So if you like it. For context, in case you guys didn't gather it, because we didn't explicitly say it, but I know most of our longtime listeners know it. Um, our dad died with us in the room, like, uh, I don't know, like seven months ago. Yeah. So that's part of where that stuff came from, just so you know. Yeah. So, yeah. uh,. Now digest that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you have a fun day. Have yeah, a good exactly. Friday. Why don't we just we should you just got some fun weekend plans. We usually like have more stuff to say at the end of the show. We should just cut it right there. <laughs> um, uh, I feel I, I feel good about. No, I, I feel I feel fine about this. I think it's I think it's good to be vulnerable and everything. So I actually feel good about it. Yeah, yeah, like I think it's I think it's good. Yeah, but yeah, no, I'm not looking to listen to it. Oh, I'm definitely never listening to this one. <laughs> yeah, no, not a fucking chance. <laughs> and I'm not watching fucking Big Fish or oh. reading it. I don't need to watch Albert Finney croak on Billy Crudup. Oh, it is Billy Crudup. Yeah. Oh, weird. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I was thinking about <laughs> Wait, that. Wait, well, I'm surprised you reacted to him. Do you have like a big reference point for Billy Crudup? Uh, only one thing. He played Doctor Manhattan in The Watchmen. Yes. Yeah, his very soft voice and a very soft penis. Um, <laughs> it's flaccid. 100%, he also, 100% flaccid the whole I time. I mean, you never know who, uh, you never know what goes on. <laughs> Thankfully, but yeah. Yeah, yeah that's better <laughs> that than would the alternative. Be, that would be much more alarming in that movie than the, the actual plot. <laughs> Mass destruction. It's that got, It's got a big heart on for it. Yeah, he would have, he would have really upstaged. <laughs> and also just, it would give the whole scene a different tone. Like... You're really enjoying this, huh? <laughs> God. Yeah. But Billy Crudup also left Claire Danes. Wait, was it Claire Danes? No, Mary Louise Parker while she was pregnant. Whoa, really? Mm-hmm. Yep. I always think of that. Ooh, that's not good. Not good at all. Um, you know, you never know what happens, but it doesn't sound like it was good. Yeah, it doesn't sound no. good at all. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Big Fish. Oh, left another... her for Claire Danes. That's where it came from. Oh, weird. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. But yeah, Big Fish is another story of like really mythologizing, taking real people and turning them into larger than life. Totally. Cartoon And characters. a dad situation. Yeah. Which I'm not equipped for. Yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, cool. Yeah. All right. Hella cool. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So next time we're doing something that's going to be highly, an- or has been highly anticipated by us. Yes. We probably won't cry. I don't think so. No, I, <laughs> I'd be very surprised. Unless we like <laughs> open the floodgates and now there's something broken inside me, I don't think I'll be crying. <laughs> you know, I know I've brought candles and stuff in here. Maybe I need to like cleanse this room now because I've, I've cried in it twice in like a week. Yeah, wait a minute. Maybe you have like doomed me. <laughs> Maybe. I'm going to need to do something. <laughs> 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 As I look around the room. No. Anyway, um, we are going to read the secret history of Twin Peaks because when we next talk to you guys, it's going to be May 19th and the revival of Twin Peaks comes out on May 21st. Yeah. So that'll be really fun. We've been looking forward to that and like planned it out to do it timing wise like that for months. Yeah, I'm very excited about yeah, this. Yeah, I am too. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I have a little bit of history with reading books like this. Uh, because I also read uh, personally. I didn't. I don't think I even even talked about it on the show. Mm-hmm. But if you guys follow any of the other stuff that I do, like if you read my website, thehauntedsponge.com, where I write sometimes little essays about horror movies and stuff, I read a book about the Blair Witch Project that is written in universe. Mm-hmm. So it's literally written as if those people that are in the movie went missing, and then somebody put together a book that's like, okay, Heather, the main character, we have her journal. Here are actual pages from her journal. Yeah. Here are news articles about... I still want to 
read that. It was pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, so I think the Twin Peaks book is a lot like that, where it's like, here's a newspaper clipping from Twin uh-huh. Peaks' uh, yeah. newspaper. So it's not a it's narrative. It's ephemeral. It's not a novel. Mm-hmm. It is a dossier. Yeah, totally. So uh, I'm very excited for that. Although it is a pretty big book. Yeah, it's... It's a much larger book than I thought. Totally. But I think there are a lot of pictures and things like that in there. Pretty like, pictures. Like, not a ton, it's but, good. like... I, I think it'll still be kind of a fast read. I'm okay. not... I'm not... Are you concerned about it? I'm not concerned about yeah, it, yeah, but yeah. I am just surprised by it. Well, the only thing that's going to be tricky for you and I logistically is that we have one copy. True. So you'll have to read it and then give it to me to read it. Okay. So, I can do that. Okay. I'll read it with supper. <laughs> oh, good. I'll, uh, I'll read it with dinner. <laughs> Does he say supper? I thought he said supper. I don't, I don't know. think so. Okay. So here is the description of the secret history of, t- of Twin Peaks by Mark Frost. From the, cro- <laughs> from the co-creator of the Landmark series, the story millions of fans have been waiting to get their hands on for 25 long years. The secret history of Twin Peaks enlarges the world of the original series, placing the unexplained phenomena that unfolded there into a fast- in a vastly layered, wide-ranging history, beginning with the journals of Lewis and Clark and ending with the shocking events that closed the finale. The perfect way to get in the mood for the upcoming Showtime series. Starts with the journals of Lewis and Clark. I think that it's deep into like the founding of Twin yeah, Peaks. And there's stuff. something about Twin Peaks, right? Oh man, I'm pretty stoked. So for this. Lewis and Clark would have been the first, yeah. you know, at least you know people that are from your like there. There must have been like Native American history, yeah. about the place, but they would be yeah. the first like sort of like uh, explorers, yeah, totally new explorers taking over the land and learning about this like weird new place. So that maybe we'll, should be maybe pr- we'll pretty get some funky. cool. Like, did you say so, that would be pretty funky? Yeah, it will be pretty funky. <laughs> it will. Like the Blair Witch book is like that, where they're like, "Yeah, hey, that stuff in the woods." <laughs> there's like it's an ancient some evil. Pe- yeah, some people yeah. think that it's like from the 1800s. Some people think it's just always been there. I love that shit. Uh, yeah, I do want to read those. You should read them. Maybe we should do a bonus they're, episode about them. Sometime. They're pretty cool. I would absolutely do that. Yeah, it'd be cool. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. So look forward to that. If you guys yeah. are interested in Twin Peaks. Uh, Consider picking up a copy. It's a pretty cool collectible. It seems like a, yeah, I would say it seems like a cool thing to just have as a collect- collectible. One hundred percent. So I'm very excited to to dig into it, especially because I'm very excited about Twin Peaks coming back. Me too. It makes me happy. Like this markage of time that by the time we record the next like sh- book club schmuck club like not an extracurricular that it's going to be like the shows in two days yeah it's now yeah. it is now my countdown yeah totally. book club schmuck club is my countdown yeah. to twin peaks yeah. coming back yeah very excited about it me too uh but of course that's in two weeks mm-hmm. in one week we will be back here on the main feed to do an off book show talking about whatever the hell we want mm-hmm. light frothy poppy yeah happy smiling faces well we'll see well who knows? I know, perhaps third time's a charm for old chrissy why don't i uh, prepare some really depressing horrible <laughs> things to talk about next week oh that'd be great that'd be wonderful wow. <laughs> more than anything i hope that you guys just enjoyed listening to this show mm-hmm. now enjoyed could mean many things yeah you sick fuck you like listening to people in pain you guys are gross <laughs> <laughs> uh I, I it could just mean that you enjoyed it on the level of like it's, interesting it's, I know. it's nice being involved in this conversation mm-hmm. uh uh, and so if you guys have anything that you would like to say about this show, uh, please don't hesitate to, to reach out to us because we're all over Twitter and Instagram. I'm at Chill and Kristen. I'm at Will Rogers 2000 and at Haunted Sponge. <laughs> yeah. Duh. Oh, what do you know about that? Doi. Uh, doi. Uh, duh. We also have the Book Club Schmook Club secret Facebook group where if you literally search for Book Club Schmook Club, yeah. S-H-M-O-O-K, mm-hmm. you can see the group, request to join, bingo bongo, you'll be in the group. It's um, totally sweet. Please also consider giving us an iTunes review, a Stitcher review, and hey. Yeah, that well's run a little dry if you guys wouldn't mind um, lubing up the iTunes reviews. Gross. I agree. Yeah. Uh, also... <laughs> <laughs> Not that you lube a well. But, also, you know. I think it's pretty clear that uh, Chris and I pour a lot of time, mm-hmm. energy, uh, emotion, heart into these shows. Yeah. So if you uh, have it in you, picture please... me reading a book in bed next to my husband and trying to cry quietly for the benefit of you guys. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. She took that on the chin. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, please consider going to patreon.com slash talk bomb where you can give back literally uh, fund help fund the show. Yes. Help produce the show. Mm-hmm. It takes a lot of moolah and it takes a lot out of us. It really does. And we will thank you guys on the show for it. P.S. 100%. If that's something that 
interests you. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, but yeah, I hope you guys had a good time. Yeah. All things considered, I had a great time. I yeah, really totally. enjoyed talking about mm-hmm. this book. Me too. All considered. Mm-hmm. And so uh, in two weeks, we'll see you in Twin Peaks. And yep. next week, we will just see you on an off book show. But until then, good talk, gang. Meeting adjourned, bitch. Yeah, you guys are. Uh, I also forgot to add, you guys are all bitches. <laughs> you could have seen will do that there's like a slight visual component that was enjoyable he was kind of like made a face the mic it was good i I just can't believe i forgot to tell them that they're all a bunch of bitches (laughs) hey guys do you like talk bomb we could really use your support please go to patreon.com slash talk bomb where you can donate to us monthly in doing so you will get for yourself a bunch of bonus shows just as a thank you you can also find us on all social media accounts under the username TalkBomb. So that's Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Snapchat. Following us online is a great way for you to stay up to date on what we're working on for TalkBomb. One of the best things you can do for our network is to review this show on iTunes, Stitcher, or whatever platform you listen to us on. Positive reviews help us grow and help new listeners find us. But more than anything, thank you for listening to the show. We hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you at TalkBomb.com. Right. I'm glad he's dead. <laughs> that was Jack Nicholson Joker thing. Yeah. yeah. Oh God. I'm with you. In light of the show, that's not a great thing to say. What? We're talking about how Dad died, and then I said I'm glad he's dead. I mean, it was totally different context. I know, but it's all just mushed together in my brain now. Like somebody could edit it out, <laughs> yeah, of, like yeah. to try to be like Kristen Rogers claims she loves her family. <laughs> like have an attack ad playing on the news. <laughs> When I run for I'm office, this is, <laughs> this is really going to bite me in the ass. Uh, we can never run for office. <laughs> no way, <Jose>. Ever. <laughs> Not after that episode about massages where I talk about my butthole being exposed to the air. Is that even on the main feed anymore? That might not. Oh, it's it might not. be free because it might only be on Patreon That's now. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Everyone. <laughs> President Rogers Anderson. I'm going to the White House, bitch. <laughs> Welcome to the Oval Office. <laughs> did you hear or did you see? I feel the... good now. Me too. Yeah. Me too. Did... Wait, are we recording? I didn't feel bad before. I was still, I'm still, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, did you see, but I feel good now too. Um, did you see the thing I retweeted about Trump not understanding George W's, um, <laughs> joke about, well, it's not even really a joke, but about how the Oval Office doesn't have any corners to hide and he didn't understand I think it at so, all. Yeah. I'm just going to read it since I said, I mean, are we going to include this? Sure. Why not? Okay, sure. Um, so I'm just pulling up my Twitter cause I, <laughs> you, you guys, my Twitter is the hottest thing in town. Yeah. I got is. a million new followers since last week. At Chill and Kristen. <laughs> Do it. I don't know if you guys noticed last week after the credits played, it was just me for 15 minutes reading from my Twitter account. Yeah. So I don't know if you guys listened to that or not, if you just stopped listening to the thing. I, but I've, I've now listened to that like three times. It's pretty good. It's I pretty listened good. to it it's too. Not bad. Yeah. I got zero new followers PS from that. Oh. Anyway, um, so it was an interview, um, and I'm not sure who this is. The interviewer was John Dickerson, which sounds like one of Grandpa's friends. Yeah, absolutely. Like, Ralph Knockerson. Yeah. <laughs> okay. John Dickerson. George W. Bush said the reason the Oval Office is round is there are no corners you can hide in. President Donald Trump, I can't do an impression. I'm not going to. Please do. Uh, uh, well, there's no truth to that. Uh, the truth. Uh, oh, no, no, no. Never mind. Okay. Well, there's truth to that. There is truth to that. There are certainly no corners. And you look, there's a certain <laughs> openness. But there's nobody out there. You know, there is an openness, but I've never seen anybody out there actually, as you can imagine. <laughs> John Dickerson. But he... What he meant was, it's all, it comes, Donald Trump. Sure, sure. John Dickerson, back to you. <laughs> <laughs> says nonsense. Yeah, he's, he says he's a fucking crazy person. He says nothing. He's a rambling idiot. What's he even talking yeah, about? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, there's an openness. There's a, yeah, certainly you look and there's nobody there. What? <laughs> what? It, was, it was him saying there's no corners to hide in the overall Oval Office. What are you talking about? <laughs> Ugh, all right. Anyway, guys. I can hear everything. I know. <laughs> Fucking crazy person. Oy. All right, meeting adjourned. Boom! Quick question. Yeah. Is there any necessity to doing... Well, I want to maybe record something. Okay. Any necessity to doing any form of disclaimer for this? Hmm. Maybe. I definitely do want to record hurt. something saying... Because uh, I'm going to be live streaming on Hunter Killer. Okay. And I do want to say on here at the beginning, mm-hmm. like, hey... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to be yes, doing this call. on Sunday evening. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, it can't hurt. 
Okay. Yeah, a little All trigger right. warning kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 